let's just raise our hands this morning. Lord, you made a way. Thank God. When there was no way. Hallelujah. Oh, you, you made. sing it. I'll tell you how we're, we're going to rejoice. We're going to do that again. But I think I'm pretty it's Nick and Tosh here. Where you at? Where they at? Wave your hand. I can't see you. There they are. Now Everly is not with them. But Everly's been born about three months premature. And it very much looked bleak. And the last week I showed you pictures of that little girl and how that God has moved. Now I want you to hear Pastor. She's not on a, she weighs about two pounds, maybe a little more since last week. She's not on a ventilator. They've unhooked all the tubes. There's nothing, she's completely on her own now. That's when we sing, you made a way. How many in this place today can raise their hand and say, I know God has made a way at times. Don't know how, but he did it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't know how. But I know he did it. I know he did it. Come on. Come on. Do you know he's a healer? Do you know he's a deliverer today? Oh, yes, he has. says no God says yes when it looks like it's an impossible situation our God steps in at the darkest hour of life and God maneuvers in such a way ah he's still saying yes today he's still saying get behind me Satan 
He's still saying greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's still telling you that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He's still telling you that, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil. He's still telling you that I can do unbelievable things in your life. One of the greatest dangers that you will ever face will be the place of where you become complacent or you become familiar with the presence of God. There should be a drawing in all of us that when we walk into God's house. There should be a drawing in us to want to get more of Him. And the danger is, is that you can feel good in the house of God but have not responded to the voice and presence of God. The danger is, is that you can feel the goosebumps and you can feel the anointing of God sweeping up and down the aisles. And you can say, I enjoy the presence of God. But the danger is, is when you don't respond to what God is putting upon you. Because that's God's way of trying to draw you and woo you and pull you so that he can get you in a position to do something that nothing in the world could compare to. So he can get you in a position where you surrender and he becomes something so great that he invades your life and he dwells inside of you and you speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance and the Holy Ghost dwells inside of your mortal being and you don't understand it and you could never quite explain it but you can say like Jeremiah said it was fire shut up in my bones you can say like Peter said it was joy unspeakable and it was full of glory it, it'll get a hold of you and like I just told Bobby, once you get it, it'll never leave you. You may get away from it for a little while. You may walk away from it for a little while. But the beautiful thing about the Holy Ghost uh, is once it's in there, there ain't nobody that can take it out. So in this service today, we have worshiped and we're going to continue. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And then we're going to have a worship of giving. And then we're going to have the worship of the Word of God. And we're going to preach the Word. And then you'll have a final opportunity in this service today to determine what you do with what you felt and with what you have heard. You will have a choice today to make to whether you sit on the pew or whether you leave and say, you know, I wanted to. I was almost there. Thou almost persuadest me. You'll have those choices to make today. And the great thing is, is that God is not done with this service yet. I, I got a prayer. I got a prayer. I got to let it out. I got a prayer. One more time, say. I, I got a prayer. I got a prayer. I got to let it out. I got a prayer. The Lord is worthy, say. The Lord is worthy. The Lord is worthy. If you're tired of praising God here, you will be so disappointed if you're fortunate enough to make it over there. Because if you're not sure of what's going to take place there, let me inform you. There will be one moment of silence. That's what the scripture says. There will be one moment of silence for all the people that think it's too loud. That'll be it. But then there for an eternity. For an eternity. 
there is going to be praise and adoration and shouting. The throne of God is going to be circled with praise like you would not imagine down here. It's going to be something, church. Man, can you imagine church over there? We talk about like it's a big deal. We talk about like it's a big deal that when we were, if you're in your 40s or beyond, we talk like it's a big deal that 30, 35 years ago that church lasted till 11 o'clock on Sunday night and they had Friday, Saturday, Sunday and all that. We act like that's a big deal. Can you imagine with a glorified body what it's going to be over there? A body that never gets tired, a body that never gets weary, a body that doesn't have to worry about getting up for work in the morning. Oh, uh, you think worship good down here? Wait till you get to that worship service. Psalmist David's going to grab a harp. That's right, I said a harp. And he's going to play that harp like ain't nobody ever seen a harp play. And he's going to sing maybe some songs that where most of the good songs have originated from, the book of Psalms. And he's going to stop every now and then and maybe give us some poetry. And then if you look at him like he's a whip, he's going to say, you better watch it. I'm the guy that killed a bear and killed a lion and took down Goliath. I'm going to grab a violin, a harp. I'm going to do one of those. Going to grab, I mean, can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get over there? Well, some people say, I'll have fun when I get over there. Well, then you go right ahead. I'm going to have fun down here. And I'm going to have more fun when I get over there. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness. In the middle of summer, what tremendous crowd gathering out to be in the house of the Lord. We have infants nursery and toddler nurseries available all throughout the service. Please take advantage of those and uh, so that everyone can receive the word today. And uh, we honor you for being in the house of the Lord. You could be anywhere today, but you are here in the house of the Lord. I thought I saw Rocky and Dolores. Where are you at, Rocky and Dolores? There they are. I'm so glad that Brother and Sister Adams are here. A lot of work sometimes hinders them, but I'm glad that they're here today. Let everybody, let Rocky and Dolores know that. Would you do that? I'm going to make it simple on you this morning. I'm going to preach trust in the Lord part two last week I began and I preached trust in the Lord and today is going to be part two of trust in the Lord Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 5 trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding now in our language he would say don't believe everything you think that'll sink in but in all thy ways, acknowledge him. And if you do this, he shall direct your paths. Hebrews 11 and 6, the apostle Paul tells us that without faith it is impossible to please the Lord. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. It is that basic level of faith that I believe that we want to tap into, that we trust in God and we believe that he is a rewarder. And I want you, if you would, lay Bibles and iPads on the pew. And let's ask God for the next few moments to just speak to our faith, that little part and compartment in our brain that we fight with every day pastor told you Wednesday night that we have two wolves that live inside of all of us and the wolf that's going to win is the one we feed the most and so let's tap into that cranium part of our brain that is faith related that says only believe what you see but the spirit world says walk by faith and not by what you see let's lift our hands and our voices or bow our heads let's ask God just for a few moments in the name of Jesus, Lord, I praise you today. I thank you for one more opportunity today. God, I've put all my trust in you. 
I don't want to lean to my own understanding, but in all my ways, I want to acknowledge you today. I want to believe in you today. I want to trust in you today. Help us all to take a journey like that. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Well, clap your hands for the word. And when you're done, high five somebody. Tell them I hope he preaches good today. <clears throat> God bless you. you. may be seated. I, if I was going to give this a different title, I would title it like this, Put All Your Eggs in God's Basket. Now that would be a good title for today as well. But we're talking about trusting in the Lord. Now I stand here and I tell you that from Genesis to Revelation, all of the famous characters of the scripture, they had many characteristics and traits and commonalities. But there was one that stood supreme and it was the one that they all had their trust in the Lord. From Moses and Joshua, going into the promised land from Nehemiah who would build a wall back because it bothered him that this wall would lay in rubble in the city of God. All the way from Elijah who would stand before Ahab and Jezebel and 850 prophets of Baal. All the way from Shimgar who would just be a farmer but one day would find himself fighting for his life. All the way from Jochebed or all the way from Esther who would say if I perish, I perish but save my people. All the way from Paul and Silas sitting in a Philippian jail praising them their Lord and their God, all the way from Peter, who would be the man who would get out of the boat and who would walk on water as long as his eyes were stayed up on the Lord, we would find that they all had a great trait together, and that was simply this, every one of them trusted emphatically in the Lord. Joseph trusted in the Lord. Daniel would trust in the Lord. And I stand here and I tell you today that if you're going to serve the Lord and if you're going to overcome the onslaught of what the world is going to throw at you in your walk with God, you and I will have to learn to trust in the Lord. Each of us will face and come up against situations that will absolutely demand a higher level of trust than just going to church and going through the calisthenics and the religious routines. The voice of God is calling out today. It has been calling out for 2,000 years. Whosoever will, let them come. The voice of God has been saying to certain men and women that if you will follow me, I will make you fishers of men. If you will put your hand on the plow and not look back, I will do things for you that they will record in the history books of the Bible and men and women will speak and sing of you all the days. The men and women that are found in the word of God, whether it was Miriam or whether it was Mary or whether it was Elizabeth or whether it was Hannah who would beg for a child to feel a desolate womb in her body, they all had a trait and that that was that they trusted inexplicitly in the Lord. I stand here today and tell you it is easy to trust God when we have money and when we have shelter and when we have automobiles and when we have a beautiful church and when there's no sickness in our body. But I want you to know that if you live long enough in this life your back will be put up against the wall and you will have to make a choice. Do you throw in the towel or do you trust in the Lord and if you trust in the Lord then you will have to lean not to your own understanding but in all your ways you will have to acknowledge God every one of us will be given the chance to trust in the Lord each of us will come up against trials and adversity trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. My way of thinking will always get me in trouble. My view on things and my speculation will always get me in trouble. But if I can trust in the Lord, then it doesn't matter what hell has put on my doorstep. It doesn't matter what the outlook is in the exam. It doesn't matter what the judge or the lawyer or the prosecuting attorney says. 
It doesn't matter if my best friend walks away. It doesn't matter if my world crumbles. If my trust is in the Lord, if I look unto the hills from which cometh my help, then I'm going to come out of the rubble when the dust has settled and the smoke is cleared. I'm still going to be standing. You're going to look and say, oh, look, he's still there. Yes, I'm still there. I'm like a tree planted by the water. I may bend. I may bow, but I'm going to come back. Why? Because my trust is in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. The word trust is used 134 times in the scripture and an overwhelming majority of those words are used in trusting God. The Hebrew and the Greek words translated in the scripture as trust literally means to hide for refuge, to be confident, to be sure, to hope, to be convinced, to rely by inward certainty, to agree, to assure, to believe, to have confidence, and to obey. That's what we're talking about today. This quiet assurance that persuades me, that gives me confidence, that assures me, that helps me yield to the ways I don't understand and the ways that I do not like. I do not like it when God puts me on the wheel and moves and takes shapes me in ways that are uncomfortable. I do not like being inconvenienced. I do not like having to go through adversity and through hard times. But I find in the scripture where every great man or woman of God that was mightily used, they had to go through a testing and a trying and a breaking. Jesus himself would be broken like bread and his wine would literally, that we take in communion, we take it as symbolic gesture of the wine that was poured out from his body or the scripture says that was shed for many and I tell you today, it is uncomfortable. Trusting is not an easy thing to do. Trusting is something that we inherently in our minds, it's not something that we just grasp and we just want to run with. It's difficult to trust in people and trust in things. I bought a new truck a year ago. It has 10,000 miles on it. And Friday night, I went to give it gas and nothing happened. Well, I take that back. It sounded like there was a thousand rocks in the motor. White smoke billowed in the cab and billowed out of the back of it. I made it home and it felt like it was coughing all the way there. It felt like it was about to faint. I went out yesterday morning and I went to start it and it shook, shaked, rattled and rolled. White smoke going everywhere. I called into the shop. I said, this truck that I bought has got trouble. And let's begin to make, the man said, what's it sound like? I said, I told him what it sounded like. He said, ooh, that don't sound good. I said, no, it don't sound good. You ought to hear it in person. If you think it sounds bad over the phone, you ought to hear it in person. He said, we're going to have to get a wrecker out there and get that in. And so they got a wrecker. They got it in. They'll tell me Monday whether the motor's blown or what. But what I'm going to tell you is the simple truth. Brother McClary has been putting it in on me for years now. And I think I finally believe it. Brother McClary's always said, if it's man-made, it's going to break. If it's man-made, it's going to have trouble. If it's man-made, it's got potential to fall apart. And I'm going to tell somebody here that if your walk is on your own strength and if your walk with God is in your own power and it's in your own might, you're going to have a breakdown somewhere. And even if it's not, you're going to have some tough times. But if you trust in the Lord, if you can step back and say, I don't understand it, it doesn't make sense, but I trust in the Lord, you're going to get through it. You're going to wake up in the morning with a shout out on your lips. Why? Because some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the Lord. Peter, you're all right. Just don't look at anything else and you won't sink. Peter was okay. Everyone busts him and gets all upset at him. Look at that guy. He sunk. He didn't have faith. Oh, yes, he had enough faith to get out of the boat. I don't read that in any other disciple. But he had enough faith. That's what we're talking about today. Everything doesn't go our way. Some days are dark. Let me be transparent today. For the believer, I'm not just talking to the sinner, but for the believer that's gathered here today, if we're all honest, we have some dark days in our walk with God. We all have some scary days. 
We have some disappointing days. We have days where we prayed and fasted and God said no. We have days where we sought the Lord with bitter tears like David said that my tears have been my meat both day and night. And yet if we're real honest, there's been times it's been hard to accept the answer of no that God sends back from his throne. And I tell you today that it's in those dark, weak moments uh, that we've got to understand that some of that is just life. Uh, and that's when our trust has to be moved to the front and center of our life. That's why I'm on a one-man campaign to tell you to get in church with all your heart. I'm on a one man campaign to tell you, put God in church first uh, above everything else. Uh, I'm on a one man campaign to tell you when the doors are open, be in church. Uh, I'm on a one man campaign to tell you that even when you're tired on Wednesday night, come on into the house of God and be refreshed uh, and be renewed. I was in the prayer room this morning uh, and the verse came to my mind, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Uh, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach us, O oh Lord, to wait upon the Lord. I've come to tell somebody today that if you feel weary and if you feel despondent, if you feel like your life is about to fall apart, get your feet planted deeper in the house of God and say, though you slay me, yet will I trust in the Lord. I've come to tell somebody, shake off the lethargicness of not wanting to be a worshiper. You started out right, but something got a hold of you. Lift up your voice. Lift up your hand. That's why the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That's why it says, lift up your voice and shout unto God like a trumpet. Everyone here, what would it take for some of you? But I don't know, pastor, I'm, I'm tied up. But I don't know, pastor. I got stuff to take care of. I don't know, pastor. Pastor, it's too hard to get up and down. We stood for 20 minutes during worship. It's your prerogative. And the reason I know that you don't have to be like that it's because there's a bunch of people that aren't like that. There's a bunch of people that really do enter those gates with thanksgiving in their heart. They got all kinds of hell going on in their life. They got all kinds of financial worries. They got all kinds of troubles. But they enter those gates with thanksgiving. They enter those courts with praise. They lift up their voice and they shout loud like a trumpet unto the Jehovah God, our provider. They lift up their hands and they praise all that because the Bible says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. In fact, the scripture tells us uh, that men ought to always lift up holy hands, praising God together. You know how you get confidence and trust in God? It's when everyone tells you there's a storm coming, you better get inside. And yet in the middle of that storm, uh, you can stand there with the assurance, uh, there's no storm big enough in this world that can move me from where God has placed me. There is no storm. I listened to a pastor last Last night and this pastor said he said I feel like giving up he said and I'm going to tell you it broke my heart he said I feel like giving up he said, I feel like throwing in the towel. He said, I feel like walking away, not from God, but from the church. He said, I'm weary in my spirit. Nobody seems to want to get excited. He said, I, I preach, I sing, I do everything I can. He said, one day I made a slight change in the church and people were more offended and moved by the slight change than they were their spirit and their adversarial spirit. He said, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to motivate the people. I don't know how to get them to do anything. I don't know how to lead them to want to worship. He said I worship God. I stand in the pulpit and I preach with all my heart. I hit the prayer rooms. He said I'm not the only one. A few of us are worshipers. But he said most people sit and gawk and stare. He said I don't know what to do and I'm going to tell you right now that's a spirit that we cannot afford to let get a hold of Christian Life Center. We cannot afford to get to a place that would drown out the voice of God and the move of God. There's got to be an active student. If you ever fight for anything, fight for worship. Fight for the anointing. Fight that God can move. Listen, where there is liberty, you will always find the Spirit of God. But where there is a stronghold, there's no worship. Where there is anointing, there is worship. But where there is no anointing, there is no worship. You've got to go after this. Trust involves closeness, intimacy. I trust certain people in my life. I could make a list of those that I trust, but there wouldn't be one person on that list that is a stranger to me. 
I would say it like this for Charlie's sake. I'm sure Urban Myers is a good man, but I couldn't stand here and tell you that I trust him. You know why? I don't know him. I don't have a relationship. I'm sure he is. I've heard nothing but good, but I can't say that I trust him because I don't know him. I only know what I've heard about him. I only know what others have said. It may give me a positive impression of Urban Myers, but I don't trust him because I don't know him. You begin to think today, even while you're sitting there, of the people that you inexplicitly trust in your life. I would say the first one for me, and I'm not talking about God, I'm talking about in this life, the first one for me would be Angie. I 100% trust her with all my heart. If someone come and told me today that Angie was flirting and was seen with another guy, I'm gonna tell you I wouldn't believe it. They'd have to bring me a video of it. They'd have to bring me a video and I would have to see it for myself. Why? Because she's proven her trust to me. She's proven her walk with me. She's proven a life of commitment to me for the last nearly 20 years. She's proven that to me. So I 100% trust her with my life. I trust her with my tears. I trust her with my hurts. I trust her with my fears. I trust her with my worries. I've often said she's the only one other than God that can give me perfect peace. If I walk into a room and there's something that's troubling me, she has the ability in a moment's time to give me absolute perfect peace. And my mama can't do that and my daddy can't do that and nobody else can do that except her and the Lord. I trust in her. I trust my father. I trust him and there are certain things I know about him. I trust that his word is his bond. I've, I've never known him to lie to me. I've never known him one time to break his word with me. I trust that man with my life. My father used to always say to me when I was a little boy, now I say it to Landon, he would always say, don't give your heart away to just anybody. He would always say, son, you've got to be careful that you don't just give your heart to anybody because they could use it to hurt you and break you and come against you. And I say that to everyone here. You better be careful who you're giving your confidence and your trust to, even in the church. You better be careful who you share your darkest moments with because they might just use that on you one day. They might just use that to hurt you. So you better be careful what you're saying and who you're speaking to. But I trust my father. I know I trust my wife. You know why? I know who she is. I know I trust my mother with all my heart. I trust my mother that she'll stick up for the devil. I trust my mother because she's that kind of a lady. She's so sweet. Her and Sister Smith are the only two ladies other than maybe my wife that might defend the enemy. But I trust my mother that sometimes she's even told, she told a girl one time to break up with me because she didn't think that I was right for her. <laughs> she did that. Only my mother would do that. But I trust my mother. I trust her love for God and her love for people. And I say this to you that if we're going to trust in the Lord, hear pastor when I say this, if you're going to trust in the Lord, it will be because you get so close to him that you know him, that you trust him, that all your confidence is in him. Psalm 73, 28 says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all his works. Uh, Paul said that I may know him in the suffering, uh, that I may know him when I'm going through trouble and when he's going through trouble, there is a connection between drawing near and trusting. David said in Psalms 91 and 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, uh, my God and in him, would somebody say it? In him will I trust. Uh, there is a closeness. Uh, there is an intimacy when you read the scripture and you hear David speaking. It's not from a man who looks at God as an acquaintance. Uh, it's not from a man who looks at God as some far off distant God. It's from a man who literally is intimate and knows God in a relationship that is one on one. That's why David could say, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my will in the middle of the will. That's why David could say, in him will I put all my trust. That's why David could say, I'm not worried about bears and lions and I'm not worried about giants because I know the ultimate giant slayer. In him will I trust. You go ahead and trust in yourself. You go ahead and trust in your money, but I think I'll put my hand in the hand of God and it's never slack. Over and over and over in the Psalms, you'll read, in him will I trust. I trust in the Lord and that trust is built upon a relationship and that relationship produces trust. You'll never trust in the Lord truly until you have a deep, deep relationship with Jesus. That's why some of you quit church off and on. Here, pastor, I'm gonna pastor. That's why some of you are in and out. Why some of you have a difficult time worshiping. 
because you don't have the kind of relationship that can worship through the storm. You only have the relationship that can worship after a storm. You don't have the relationship that is so deep and so rooted that no matter what comes or goes, you're staying in the church. You have the kind of relationship that when the going gets tough, the tough just get right on going. Am I all right today? You don't have that relationship that says, whether my friends forsake me or my husband or my wife or my children walk away, I'm staying in the church. No, you've got the relationship that says, all my trust is in my family and in my children. And Jesus said, you better love me more than your father and your mother and your brother and your sister. He said, you better love me more than anything else in this world. And if you don't and you don't have that relationship, then when tough times come or when the enemy sends strong winds of adversity, guess what? It's not shocking that you walk away. Why? Because you were never rooted in the things of God. It's not shocking that your kids walk away with you. Why? Because you never taught them to be rooted in the things of God. It's not shocking that someone says so-and-so is no longer going to church. Why? Because they were never truly vested in the kingdom of God. They loved what they felt. They came to church. Oh, they, they, they enjoyed the social aspect of it, but they were never truly invested in the things of God. So you get to a place where you realize that trust, and hear me when I say it, trust is a choice. All of us put our trust somewhere even if our trust is in ourselves. Remember that in our text, part of trusting in one thing is not trusting in another. Part of trusting is leaning not to your own understanding. To trust in the Lord is to refuse to trust in other things. Listen to what the scripture says about trust. Psalms 118 and 8, it is better to trust in the Lord. I wish I had somebody who was a quick, fast reader. I'd have them run up here and read all these. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Psalms 44 and 6, for I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. Psalms 146 and 3, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, or in whom there is no help. You've got to make a conscious decision to stop trusting in some things so that you can put your trust in other things. Can you hear me in the cheap seats back there? You've got to stop trusting in certain things so that you can put all your eggs in the trust bucket of Jesus Christ. Uh, that means bring it on. When the enemy comes in like a flood, bring it on. The spirit of the Lord is gonna lift up a standard against it. I'm gonna tell you something. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to have your head down. You don't have to say, woe is me. Get up, lift up your head, look onto the hills, their street coming. There's power coming. There's anointing coming. There's victory in the wings of God here today. Bishop Billy McCool told a story years ago. It was 1995 at the old campground. And he told a story and he entitled his message, Sleeping on a Stormy Night. I don't know if anybody remembers it. But he said there was this man. He worked on a farm. And he said he could always tell when a storm was coming. And so sure enough, one night it came. Bad storm picked up on the horizon. And while all the other farmers were running around like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to close their barn doors and get the windows shut and the shutters up and get the animals in the, in the stalls and all that, someone said to this farmer, said, what are you gonna do? He said, I think I'm gonna go to sleep. And the man said, you can't go to sleep. There's a storm coming. And the farmer said, I can go to sleep. He said, because number one, I prepared. And number two, I know who's in control of the storm. I would say this to us. I'm going to sleep on some stormy nights. Why? Because number one, I've already been prepared by the way I've been living. And number two, I know the master of the wind. I know who can tell Satan enough is enough. I know that hell can't make it darker. Hell can't make it longer. Hell can't make it stronger. Why? Because I know the master of the wind. And when God says it's over, it's absolutely over. Where do you trust today? Who do you trust today? Where is your trust today? I trust in him. You got to make a decision, a conscious decision to stop trusting in some things so that you can trust in other things. Now here, pastor, that really is what repentance is all about. I refuse to trust in the world. Therefore, I won't continue to live in sin. 
I refuse to trust in the world. And if that's your conscious choice, then you've got to go and turn away from the world and stop living in the sin and in the muck of the world. Because if you don't trust in the world, that means you only have one other thing to trust. That's in God. So if you don't trust in the world and you don't lean to your own understanding, then you got to start trusting in God. Well, if you're going to trust in God, you got to get to know God. You can't just come to church and sit on a pew. Not if you're going to know him. I know Angie. I know what she likes. I know what she doesn't like. She doesn't like it. I don't do it. But I will say I broke loose yesterday and I did about eight of them in a row. It just I couldn't contain it. couldn't hold it in. I mean, I did it and the next thing I know, I wasn't even in control of my body anymore. The hands were slapping. But I said, that's it, Angie. I'm done for the night. I know her. I know what she doesn't like. I, I know what, I, and she knows what I like. She, she knows what I don't like. She knows, she knows that, that that stuff she made last night was way too spicy for me. Landon, you live in my home. You eat my food. And if I say it's spicy, it was too spicy. Therefore, next week, it's not going to be as spicy. Don't tell her what it is. This is mother. Hey, I'm preaching up here. You don't be giving recipes while I'm preaching the word. My God. But I know her. She knows me. We have a trust there. So I'm not going to continue to live in sin because I know that the wages of sin is, I know that the lust, when lusts have been conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth. So why would you want to live for that, that ruler and that God of this world? No, no, no. You want to flip it around and you want to put your trust in the ultimate God, the only God that's going to come back. Uh, and when he comes back, uh, he's going to reign and rule over this old sin-filled world. That's where our trust is today. That's where you'll find it. Paul said that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. He said, but we preach Christ Jesus. Unto the Jews, he said, it's a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, he said, it's foolishness. But he said, unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolish, foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, here, pastor, is still stronger than men. The foolishness of God is still wiser and the weakness of God is still stronger. Put your trust somewhere else if you want. Just give me your attention just for a few moments before we leave. Put your trust somewhere else if you want. You show it by the way you live for God. You show it through inconsistency. You show it through by haphazard living. If we're there, we're there. If we're not, we're not. And who cares? But when you put your trust in God, you begin to realize that God is more trustworthy on a bad day than the best this world can give me on its best day. The last Psalm uses an interesting word. It's an active word. The word is put. That is an active word. That is a conscious choice word. That is I've decided type of word. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, he said put. He said, it's a word that means you burn your bridges. It's a word that means you cut the rope behind you. Put your trust in the Lord. Not find, not discover, not locate, but you systematically, you purposely put, you place it there. You consciously work at getting so close to God and knowing him so well and developing such a relationship with him that is so strong that you safely can put your trust there. You have a choice where you place your trust today. You decide where you put your trust today. The psalmist gives us insight about putting your trust and where to put it. That's why he could say in Psalms 4 and 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. That's why he could say in Psalms 5 and 11, but let all those that put, that put, that put, that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defends them. Let them also that love thy name 
Be joyful. You will get happy if you put your trust in God. You will be protected if you put your trust in God. You will be lifted up if you put your trust in God. Your countenance will change if you put your trust in God. You will have hope if you put your trust in God. Come on, stand. Psalm 7 and 1, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Psalms 9 and 10, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Psalm 16 and 1, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Psalms 25 and 20, O keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Psalms 31 and 1, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Oh, I wish I could preach a while. Let me never be apologetic for saying I am a one God apostolic, tongue talking Holy Ghost filled, holiness believing, Christian I don't want to put my trust in government that's why I'm not worked up over the election, who cares I could care less say oh pastor, bad things are going to happen, let me tell you, it's already done for bad things are going to happen no matter who's sitting in that office. There's a wickedness that only God's going to be able to remove. And only the church has the antidote and answer for. So who cares? Why would you get all your blood pressure worked up over an election of people you'll never meet and will never do one thing for you? Go ahead and put your trust in the government. Oh, the big pastor, they got a government program. That ain't going to fix your problem. I hate to tell you, Donald Trump's not getting on Trump one and flying to your house and giving you a bunch of money. It ain't going to happen. Do you hear, Pastor? But I got one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I've got one that said I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Does anybody hear me in the back? I've got one that said I'll never leave you nor forsake you and I'll be with you to the ends of the world. It's not just in the government. I don't put all my trust in the economy. I don't put it all in the stock market or a job. I don't put it in all in doctors or lawyers or judges. Governments rise and fall, jobs come and go, homes run down, and old Dodge Rams break down. Friends will forsake you, but there is a friend, students, here, Pastor. You'll make a choice. Oh, you'll make a choice. There's a friend that stick it closer than a brother. So I want to tell you what me and my house are going to do because it's the only house I can really speak for. Now, I can tell you what's going to be preached in this house. But I'm not a dictator or a legalistic pastor. You can do what you want. But I'm going to preach it and I'm going to live it and I'm going to tell you what this church is going to do. And then you'll have to figure out whether you're going to walk in it or not.